Citroen's classy, glassy, seven-seater Grand C4 Picasso brought a new level of sophistication to the Mini MPV market at its launch in 2006, and still does. This improved version features sharper design, extra equipment, and more efficient EHDI diesel engines. For growing families, it's an avant-garde people carrier that continues to combine style and substance like little else. Citroen knows a thing or two about MPVs. Back in the early years of this century, its old Zara Picasso overcame patchy build quality and the limitations of just five seats to outsell anything that Ford or Vauxhall could offer in the affordable compact people carrying segment. A tough act to follow then for its successor, the C4 Picasso launched in 2006 and available as a five-seater model or in the seven-seat Grand C4 Picasso guys that we're looking at here. Futuristic looking and with its glassy roof, this was a car ahead of its time, which was just as well, for as it aged, a whole army of rivals from Ford, Peugeot, Mazda and Renault, to name but a few, sprang up to steal its thunder. Yet this car still looks current and would have done so even without the minor styling tweaks added to the improved model which was launched in the autumn of 2010. And that's the version that we're looking at here. Since launch, the C4 Picasso model line has been a very successful one for Citroen, with over 650,000 sales made, uh, over 63,000 of those to UK customers. Of course, it's helped that this vehicle's model lifetime has spanned a period that's seen demand for compact MPVs spiral to 1.3 million sales annually across Europe. Now, continuing this kind of sales performance in the face of a much stronger pack of chasing competitors will be difficult, and to do so, this Citroen will need more than its futuristic looks. Extra equipment would be helpful, so would an improved and more efficient engine range, both of which are provided for the enhanced C4 Picasso model lineup that we're looking at here. But will it be enough? Let's find out. Now, climbing aboard the Grand C4 Picasso for the first time may leave you taken a little aback. Its glass area would, after all, do justice to a modest greenhouse. The first thing to catch your eye is this windscreen that stretches up and almost over your head. Now, if you're worried that that'll fry your head on a hot day, then don't be. Uh, a sun blind that uh, pushes forward um, is, and also has the usual sun visor attached to it solves the problem. If you don't use it, and also tick the box for the optional full-length panoramic glass roof that stretches all the way back to the third row of seats, then the cabin takes on a very airy feel indeed. And it's as easy to see out of the sides and the front of the car as it is to see out of the top of it. The wishbone-shaped front A-pillars have a glazed centre section that aids visibility, and the low window line not only makes manoeuvring easier, but also makes it easier for kids in the rear to see out, potentially reducing the chance of them feeling sick. So, it's different to sit in, but will it be so to drive? Well, if you've opted for one of the semi-automatic EGS models, like the one I've got here, the answer is very definitely yes, uh, at least at first. Until you master the way the system works and lift off between changes made via the steering column mounted gear shifter, then this is a transmission that can, at first acquaintance, feel jerky and unresponsive. Though once you actually get used to it, the whole thing works really very well. I can see though why many customers would feel more comfortable with the conventional manual gearbox that's also offered, or even the conventional automatic that's available further up the range. Whatever transmission you select though, um, one thing remains constant, the silky smooth ride which irons out the imperfections of our appalling road network, even if you're not fortunate enough to be in a plush exclusive model like this one that features um, air sprung self-leveling rear suspension. You can't have everything of course, and in this case what you can't have is an MPV you'll be happy to throw about when the road gets twisty. Should you need to do that, you'll find actually there's a surprising amount of grip, but there's little pleasure to be had in the process, partly because the steering offers so little uh, road feel. 
but that of course makes this car a pleasure to twirl around town and very simple to park both things that will be of considerably higher priority for target market families. They'll also be pleased to note that refinement is excellent. These people will almost certainly be wanting a diesel if past sales form is any guide, but in case not, Citroen also offers two 1.6 litre petrol options, an entry level 120 brake horsepower normally aspirated unit and a 155 brake horsepower THP turbocharged variant which uh, makes rest of 60 in 9.8 seconds on the way to a top speed of 127 miles an hour. As for those diesels, well, there's a two-way choice when it comes to the 110 brake horsepower 1.6 litre HDI that most customers choose. Order it either with conventional six-speed manual transmission or in the EHDI form that I've got here, where you get a package of energy saving measures linked to a six-speed semi-automatic EGS gearbox. Now, neither approach uh, with this engine really has enough speed to get the pulse racing. The EHDI version taking nearly 14 seconds to get from rest to 60. So if you do want something still sensible, but a bit pokier, then your Citroen salesperson will doubtless point you in the direction of the two liter HDI model, able to get uh, from rest to 60 about three and a half seconds faster than the 1.6 HDI on the way to a top speed of 121 miles an hour. The 2 litre HDI comes with either 150 or 160 brake horsepower, depending on whether you order it with uh, manual or automatic transmission. It says much for the forward-thinking nature of this car's original design that its looks still appear fresh and current in comparison to more recently introduced rivals. As for those uh, lately introduced changes, well, you'll need to be a bit of a citrophile to spot them. Uh, trendy LED daytime running lights sit at the corners of the revised front bumper. There are redesigned tail lamp clusters and a bigger, more prominent Citroen double chevron badge on the tailgate and on the front grille. Otherwise, things are much as before, this remaining as big a vehicle as most families will really want. It is, after all, over four and a half metres long and getting on for two metres wide. In setting these kinds of dimensions and redefining the practicality they would enclose, Citroen's designers sought help not only consulting potential buyers, but even going as far as to mount tiny cameras into their cars so they could watch how these vehicles were used on an everyday basis. And the result of all this attention to detail? Well, you see it everywhere around the cabin. Endless storage bins, trays, cup holders, and a neat fold flat seating mechanism that makes accessing the third row of seating that you get in all Grand C4 Picasso models just about as easy as it can be. Now this is due to the way that the outer seats in the second row fold up like cinema seating and slide forward at the tug of a handle for easier access to the very back. Now here, as an adult, in the very rearmost third row is where you really notice the difference between a large MPV and a stretched seven-seater compact MPV like this one. You wouldn't want to be back here as an adult for a long journey, but it's fine on shorter ones. Otherwise, it's uh, uh, a place in the car that's best left to your kids. A lot of the time, potential buyers won't be using these third row chairs anyway instead folding them into the floor to take advantage of the huge 672 litres of space that's then created. And if you've opted for one of the plusher models with adjustable air sprung suspension, then you can even lower the back of the car down to more easily accept heavier loads. Fold all of the middle and third row seats down, a feat that can be accomplished in an impressive 20 seconds, and there's a massive 1,951 litres of space to play with. In the middle row, though your knee room can be compromised a little if you use these fold-out tables, you'd be reasonably comfortable here on a long jaunt, particularly if you take advantage of the way that these seats can slide backwards and forwards to increase your legroom or that of those behind. There are, well, there's also a reclining mechanism so that you, you can relax a bit more on a longer trip. 
Up front, the driving position is high, but benefits from a tilt and reach adjustable steering wheel. The seats may look a bit thin, but they're actually very well proportioned and supportive for longer trips. And uh, the Citroen centre display, it's typical kind of characterful Citroen. Uh, you can, if you choose, um, specify in a form that will illuminate in no fewer than five different colours. No, I wouldn't bother either. More usefully, there are separate controls for the heating and air conditioning at either end of the dash. More initially confusing is the uh, steering wheel with its fixed centre hub and its initially daunting set of buttons. But uh, after a brief period of acclimatisation, they soon begin to make sense. One of the reasons for putting all the buttons on the wheel here is uh, it does away with the need for the kind of centre console you'd normally get here, further emphasising the feeling of roominess that sums up what this car is all about. For the same reason, there's no traditional handbrake, just this button on the top of the dash. And if you opt for the EGS semi-automatic transmission, there isn't even a gear stick to get in the way either, just this column-mounted stalk at the top of the steering wheel area. Uh, it all creates a cabin in which there's a wide space between the front seats and a feeling of openness wherever you look. Not all the plastics used are of the highest grade, but it, it really feels decently built. And there's plenty of room for the detritus of family life, all your odds and ends. I particularly like this storage box it, uh, the, at the bottom of the dash area. It's refrigerated so that you can keep your drinks cool. Neat. Pricing resides in the 18 to 25,000 pound bracket, and you're looking at a premium of around 1,400 pounds over comparable examples of the smaller five seat C4 Picasso that'll suit smaller families better. But what about rivals to the seven seater grand C4 Picasso that we're looking at here? Well, you might like something really large, like say a Volkswagen Sharan, a Seat Alhambra, or Ford's S-Max or Galaxy models. But these are pricier cars, and they're also bigger and bulkier than you really might want for your lifestyle. All of which means that if you find something like this Citroen sized and priced more to your taste, then for accurate comparison, you really need to be pitching it against Renault Scenic sized compact mini MPV people carriers that have been stretched to take seven people. Now that means cars like Renault's Grand Scenic, uh, the Peugeot 5008, uh, Ford's Grand C-Max, maybe even the Mazda 5. You could also choose to include bargain basement alternatives like the Chevrolet Orlando, but Citroen has made it clear by building in an upmarket interior and uh, all that clever glasswork that it doesn't want to price this car against the cheapest models in this segment. And against the mainstream uh, competitors that I mentioned previously, this Grand C4 Picasso actually stacks up very well. If we take the entry-level 1.6 litre petrol variant, for example, well, it will cost you a few hundred pounds more than you'd pay for equivalent Renault or Peugeot models, but there's not a huge amount in it, and you'll pay about the same as you would for uh, an equivalent Master 5 and save about a thousand pounds over an equivalent Ford Grand C-Max. But most buyers in this sector would be looking for diesel, and in the case of this Grand C4 Picasso, at the 1.6 litre 110 brake horsepower HDI diesel. In comparison to that model, well again, you might save a few hundred pounds if you go for an equivalent uh, Renault Grand Scenic or Peugeot 5008, but it's probably nothing that your Citroen dealer couldn't match. And when you pitch the 1.6 HDI against, uh, say, a Ford Grand C-Max or a Mazda 5, you're looking at saving 400 or 800 pounds respectively. Whichever Grand C4 Picasso model you choose, 120 or 155 brake horsepower 1.6 litre petrol or 1.6 or 2 litre HDI diesel, you should find your car to be decently equipped. Most models come with things like rear parking sensors, electrically folding mirrors, a USB socket and uh, Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, plusher variants like this one also get Citroen's clever e-touch um, emergency and assistance system uh, via which you can call the emergency services to come and help you in the event of an accident. And if you're incapacitated, it'll even automatically call them for you. 
Now hopefully the provision of the very latest electronic braking traction and stability systems should make that eventuality less likely. But if the worst should happen, front seat occupants are protected by twin front and side airbags and side window bags cover the first two rows. Deadlocks are of course fitted to deter thieves and the option of laminated side windows also add to safety and security. Now the biggest change made to this improved Grand C4 Picasso lineup was the inclusion of Citroen's latest eHDI micro hybrid technology on 110 brake horsepower 1.6 litre diesel models. Now, this uh, includes a package of energy saving measures that runs to the latest generation stop start system with an eco booster to instantly restart the engine after it's cut out to save you fuel when you're waiting at the lights or stopped in uh, urban traffic. You also get a reversible alternator that uh, can recover energy that would normally be lost under braking. Now, the result of all these measures is a combined cycle fuel consumption figure of 54.3 miles to the gallon and a CO2 return of 136 grams per kilometre. Now, at first glance, those figures don't look a lot different from those you'd get in the normal six-speed manual gearbox 1.6 litre HDI version of this car. But that's until you take account of the fact that all eHDI models are equipped with Citroen's semi-automatic six-speed EGS gearbox. Further up the range, those wanting the more powerful 150 brake horsepower 2 litre HDI diesel with its six-speed manual gearbox will, Citroen claims, find themselves able to achieve 49.6 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and put out 149 grams per kilometre of CO2. If you simply must have petrol power, then the entry-level 120 brake horsepower 1.6 delivers 40.9 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 159 grams per kilometre of CO2. Virtually the same figures also returned by the turbocharged 155 brake horsepower 1.6 litre THP petrol variant. Uh, residual values, uh, well they're a little better than uh, some of the uh, French Mark's other offerings. Uh, the Picasso has a very good reputation on the used market. And insurance groupings, well, they range between 14 and 19 on the 1 to 50 grouping scale. Now, it'd be easy to forget this car in a compact MPV market filled with newer seven-seat models, but that would be a mistake. This Citroen remains as practical and versatile as any car in its sector, and features like the extending front windscreen still give it a showroom appeal that many competitors can't match. Of course, it'd be even better if some of the unique features of plusher Grand C4 Picasso models, the uh, E-Touch emergency and assistance system and the air sprung self-leveling rear suspension, for example, could be extended and used more widely across a range that would then have real standout advantages over rivals. But even as it is, this car's improved lineup is a strong one. Its extra equipment and more efficient engine range stacking up well on a spec sheet that only a few decades ago would have read like an impossible dream for growing families confined to family hatchbacks and cramped estate cars. They expect more these days, and MPVs like this deliver. <laughs>